the cloud. So we're off. Uh, absolutely warm welcome to everybody on the call. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, a special warm welcome to Emma and to Tom. And I really hope you're going to uh, find our talk interesting tonight. I think uh, maybe we owe the audience an apology before we start um, for underselling. Uh, tonight's talk, um, uh, partly due to the modesty of one of the speakers, um, if I find how he described himself, Tom is a semi-retired low temperature physicist with a background in developing closed cycle cooling systems for infrared astronomy and Earth observation. Well, um, I wouldn't have said that. I would have said he is a legend in the world of cryogenics. And uh, th there's uh, just a handful of people um, who could do what he has done in developing cryo coolers for applications in space. Um, and uh, I have to say, uh, it was a masterstroke by Benjamin uh, to hire him when he was nearing the end of his career as head of cryogenics in Rutherford Appleton Lab. So am I, am I out of turn of what I'm saying there? Is that? Uh, You're absolutely spot on, John. He's the most humble um, person out there, but he is an absolute world leader in his field and we bagged him at just the right moment. <laughs> So the Hannies don't really know what they've got in their midst. Um, they don't. <laughs> um, so, hey, absolutely fantastic uh, to have you uh, here tonight to give this talk. And I think uh, the folks want to hear from you, not from me. So uh, who's going to start? That'll be me. I, I'm going to be uh, Emma's glamorous assistant for the evening. <laughs> 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 okay, so if I show my screen. Right. I hope you can all hear that. Um, and, and see that. Right. Talk tonight is going to be in two parts. I'm going to do a little bit of the some science and the rationale and why uh, this firm called Benjamin uh, is, is in Cornwall. And then I'm just going to give a, a talk to us about the, the Benjamin story and a bit more background and the economics, uh, what it does. Now, Benjamin is, itself is based in, in Cornwall. And it's a firm set up to address uh, green issues. And we're based in Newquay and near Truro in Cornwall, most delightful part of the world. It, it's a growing firm with engineers, uh, workshop analysis tools, etc. And um, what we're doing there is trying to change the economics for, particularly on for farmers, particularly on dairy farms. And Cornwall is a particularly difficult area. Uh, it's got many dairy farms. It's got many restaurants. You know, uh, uh, Rick Stein is based in Padstow. He owns most of Padstow. But those, um, generally because of the poor natural gas infrastructure there, they use propane, for example. And, uh, you know, that's, that's getting very expensive. And a lot of them are looking to... Um, to, 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 to use um, uh, alternative sources because it's cheaper. Um, so climate change, I, I mean, oh God, this is really, really, really complicated and I'm oversimplifying everything here just with a, with a potted description of what it is because everybody knows about sort of the global warming and uh, the methane um, thing. And, and this is a familiar hockey stick graph. And you can see on the right-hand side here over more recent years, it's, it's done here from, from about 1850. And of course, that's the sort of start of the Industrial Revolution, you know, when, uh, when uh, 
factories and uh, potteries, etc., started belching out fumes. And, and this is the global surface temperature as observed uh, um, uh, over, the, uh, over the years from 1850 to 2020 on this right hand scale here. Now, um, you can simulate these things. You can obviously say, well, what would the temperature be if there were no man, um, uh, uh, man made involvement in, in the, uh, uh, sorry, chemistry? And this is this bottom line here. So you can see that things would generally chug along as, as they always have done. You know, but obviously, we've got this, this hockey stick here on, on our right hand screen. On the right hand graph there. Now the left hand graph goes back even further and um, what this does here is we're looking here at um, reconstructed uh, uh, global temperatures, this, this sort of this gray line that we've got here. Now how does that, uh, you know, obviously we're we were making really big, big um, changes uh, to our lifestyles and, and ho hopefully to our lifestyles and to the way we, we use energy and, and greenhouse gases. But, um, you know, that's predicated on, on this uh, data that's uh, reconstructed from, from uh, um, many, many years ago. So, so well, what is the greenhouse effect? Well, you know, we all have greenhouses, but it doesn't work quite like a greenhouse does. But almost. Uh, the, the Earth's atmosphere really is quite transparent to light. Uh, so it's more transparent to light than it is to thermal radiation. So the sun burns in, in one corner here and uh, the light hits the, the Earth, warms it up, and that re-radiates energy out. Now, if we didn't have any greenhouse gases, the Earth would cool and we would end up in an ice age. We would be frozen. It, it's we, we do need some sort of greenhouse gases to, um, to keep the balance right. And it's all a question of balance. Now, I'm really simplifying things here, so I will accept any criticism about this, but in the upper atmosphere, you collect uh, gases like CO2, methane, uh, nitrogen oxides and aerosols. And we, we all know a bit, quite a lot about aerosols because they were, um, responsible for degradation in the uh, ozone layer, in the, the, particularly in the southern hemisphere, to a lesser extent in the northern hemisphere. Now, light coming in can get reflected by clouds in the upper atmosphere as well. Um, so it's all part of this, this balance. And, you know, by doing this, by the industrialization of the, of, of, of the globe, we've, um, we've actually upset this balance in many ways. So greenhouse gases, you hear an awful lot in the literature about GWP, which is global warming potential. I mean, this is basically, it's the amount of heat absorbed by a gas per kilogram compared to carbon dioxide. That's important. So if you have carbon dioxide uh, and methane up in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide has a unit of one. Uh, all the other greenhouse gases have uh, multipliers on that. And now I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. So the greenhouse gases depends on the lifetime of the gas. So it's commonly prefixed by the time frame, and it's an indicator of, uh, of the harm that the gas can cause. So, so methane, for example, hangs around in the uh, upper atmosphere with a lifetime of, I don't know, 20, 25 years, I believe it is. So if you look at the sort of the greenhouse molecules, um, you know, the, the, that are responsible for global warming, why, 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 do, why are they be more important than other gases like hydrogen and carbon monoxide? Well, the, the, the reason is that, that these gases are a bit more complicated and uh, carbon dioxide is methane. Now, if you, I hope you can see my little vignette in the corner of your screen being the speaker, but carbon dioxide, you, you think of um, uh, a, a mass, uh, a spring and, uh, and an oxygen atom. So we've got carbon, spring, oxygen atom, carbon, spring, oxygen atom, two sides. So it's quite complicated. If you think you, you, you've got the oxygen atoms can go like that, they can go like that. They've got many complicated modes. Now, if you've got infrared ra radiation coming through, which is a thermal radiation, it will absorb at those frequencies. So if you've got a gas that's very complicated with lots of different vibrational modes, such as methane, then it will absorb more uh, energy 
Okay, that's compared to simple molecules like hydrogen or carbon monoxide, which are just two, two little oscillators, you know, which, which will absorb very little infrared radiation. So the simple molecules are more transparent to infrared, infrared radiation and less responsible for the greenhouse, uh, uh, greenhouse effect. Whereas more complicated molecules like carbon dioxide and methane uh, are actually absorb the energy and give us this thermal blanket over the um, over uh, over the earth, which um, which traps in the heat. So on this basis, carbon dioxide is a global warming potential of one, as previously defined. In comparison, uh, methane has one of eighty six. Uh, and nitrous oxide, one of 265. Now, there isn't a massive amount of nitrous oxide, but there is quite a lot of methane. So its effect is really quite um, severe in terms of um, greenhouse uh, warming. Um, if we go on a bit then, um, this is um, a, a table of just some, some of the gases, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nitrous oxide. And over 20 years, uh, over 100 years, and the, the lifetime here. So methane in, in, the, um, in the upper atmosphere has a lifetime of around about 12 years. Carbon dioxide stays in forever. Nitrous oxide, 121 years. So it's quite long lived. So over 20 years, now the 20 year one it figures is one that's um, uh, most often quoted. I mean, that's basically because we've got to do something within 20 years, otherwise we're doomed, um, basically. So the 100 year figure is, is a little academic, you know, but, uh, but there we go. Now, these are, are figures from the most recent IPCC report. Now, it really is worth um, looking that up on, you know, just Googling and having a read of it. It's very accessible. There's an awful lot of information there. And it, it's very quite, quite well Quite, quite read. Um, I, I was listening on, on the radio the other day um, about a, a doctor who was looking at replacing the propellants in asthma inhalers, because that has a, a hundred year global warming potential of between a thousand and three thousand. And is, is actually on the scale of things because of this large figure is significant. Uh, and trying to move people from Twenty-three thousand five hundred, and a lifetime of about a hundred years of three thousand two hundred years. Now, um, uh, where do you find SF six? Well, in switch gear, and a lot you get a lot of switch gear in uh, wind turbine farms as well, which is a bit, <laughs> which is a bit bit annoying because they're supposed to be very green, and, and they can have the the opposite effect. Okay, but read the IPCC reports. They're very, they're very good, actually, uh, for, from them. Now, what, what are the sources um, from uh, of the methane? Well, the United Nations Environmental Program uh, uh, has, has actually quantified the, these figures. Um, and that, this is also a very good read and, and it's worth, worth looking up. Uh, this guy at the bottom left really looks a culprit. Um, he looks really suspicious to me, and indeed he, he is, because agriculture is, is 40% of, of the, the methane uh, emissions. Um, I mean, there, that, that's surprising, you know, because there's been a lot in the news about oil and gas fields um, uh, leaking uh, methane in, into the upper atmosphere, and uh, more recent data from the Tropomi um, uh, instrument on one of the Sentinel satellites, you know, has, has actually mapped that globally uh, for the past um, past few years. So it's um, agriculture is really quite a big um, uh, big thing. Waste is another one from from uh, landfill sites. Okay, fugitive methane. Well, what what is fugitive methane? Well, it's it's methane that escapes from captivity. Um, so um, you you have cow poo. Yeah, the culprits over here eat the grass. They do what comes naturally, 
And, and what, what does a farmer do with that? Well, the farmer just dumps it into a big lagoon um, conventionally. Uh, and this is a picture of one and it's massive. And this is bubbling away here, releasing uh, methane and escapes into the atmosphere. But, but methane is a fuel. Uh, I mean, it's no sea gas. It what, what, what comes out of your, um, you use for cooking with. It's exactly the same stuff. Um, but it's also a fuel that can be used to power vehicles. More importantly is that, you know, we're using um, diesel. It can replace diesel. You can run a diesel engine off, off methane with a small amount of modification. So the existing sort of equipment infrastructure itself is actually quite well suited for, for this. Emma will describe other ways that the methane can be used um, locally as well. Um, it's also, it is, it is a store of energy as well, and I'll explain how that happens. So this is the, um, the, 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 the cycle, really, if you like. So you have grass, it grows, the sun comes down, energy comes up. There, if you take over a year, um, one square meter has the same of grass will produce the same energy as a liter of petrol. So you can see it's, it's, it's a very significant, um, you know, uh, resource there that's just being, being lost. So our um, rather sad looking cow here eats the grass, uh, does what comes naturally, uh, which then goes into a covered slurry lagoon. And this produces uh, biogas, I'll explain what biogas is in, in a minute. This is then processed to give us the, the, the biomethane, which is then stored now, the storage is interesting here because you can either store it as compressed uh, gas or as liquid. Now, if obviously the processing requires um, power, but if you take that power off peak from wind turbines when, you know, or, or solar, you know, when, when, they're, when they're available, process the methane into a liquid form, then that's a battery. You just release it whenever you need it, and you can, that could be used to, to level. Most of the world's problem in terms of energy isn't actually uh, producing the energy itself, it's storage, you know. You, know, you, don't, get, you don't get any um, power when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. I mean, it's these sort of issues that uh, we, we need to, to sort of address. Okay, so slurry lagoons on dairy farms act as a collector and a concentrator of waste biomass. Okay, now this recent leg legislation is coming in where it's going to say that all lagoons have to be covered. Uh, and we'll, we'll explain a bit more about that and also a bit more about the e economics. But a typical dairy farm produces six times more methane than it can use. So the, the business, one of the business models is to collect, uh, sell and share the profit with the farmer. A gas tractor. Uh, running on fugitive methane can take the equivalent of 680 cars off the road annually. Interestingly, a typical 150 head dairy farm produces 40,000 kilograms of methane, which is worth about 40,000 uh, pound retail. Um, now, it, it really is a sad fact. And when you next go to the, the supermarket, a farmer can earn more from the, the, the the cow poo than he can from selling milk, which, you know, milk, milk is it really is a premium product and we get it for buttons. So you should cherish that pinter and, and just think about the poor dairy farms. And a lot of them are going out of business because of pressure from uh, imports and pressures from the supermarkets, which see obviously see milk as a, a you know, a, um, you know, a staple, uh, which uh, should be as cheap as cheap as chips. And it's not doing us any good, I'm afraid. But also from the from uh, proper management of the uh, anaerobic digester, and uh, we'll say a bit more about this. Um, you get improved fertilizer savings distribution. Our, our one of our team um, farmers reckons that, that you would save thirteen thousand pound a year uh, in fertilizer from uh, from doing this. It, it really is a, a typical problem as well. It is. The, the, the digestate, the residue that you get from the anaerobic digester is actually much easier to spread on the field and uh, the, the, the cow poo. You know, you've seen them go around, you know, slinging muck everywhere. You know, uh, it really is quite a, a, 
uh, obscene practice. And in places like Wales, where the geography is sort of gives you uh, farms on slopes leading into watercourses, it's a huge problem because you get you get rain, and if, if the the slurry isn't uh, distributed properly, it just runs off into the watercourse and, uh, and pollutes it. So biogas is what comes off an anaerobic digester. So on the farm, this is 60% uh, methane, 40% carbon dioxide, water, and trace hydrogen sulfide. So we, we can remove the water and the hydrogen sulfide using uh, carbon uh, recyclable filters. And the carbon dioxide can then also be mostly removed using permeable membranes brains, or, or cryogenic technology. We, we, we do both. And it can be stored either as a, a gas or a liquid. Um, now over to Emma to talk a bit more about the um, economics. Thanks, Tom. Just going to test my technical skills to see if I can take over. <laughs> okay, am I sharing? I feel like I'm sharing. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so Tom sort of outlined the problem in terms of fugitive methane, you know, its impact to the atmosphere, its impact on climate change. He spoke a little bit about the opportunity, but I'm going to spend the rest of the talk actually talking about the opportunities that fugitive methane presents. And the thing that I absolutely love about innovation is that it gives us the ability to turn a problem into an opportunity. And that's what we've been doing at Benjamin is trying to look at this fugitive methane and turn it into an opportunity for everybody involved. Now, the company itself, it started 11 years ago. And actually the problem we were trying to solve at that time had nothing to do with methane emissions. The co-founders were friends, they were surfing buddies based in Cornwall. As Tom said, you know, grid infrastructure is challenging there. Um, they were becoming more environmentally aware and they wanted to find a way to take their homes off grid, re reduce or eradicate reliance on fossil fuels and just become micro scale producers of renewable energy. So when they looked across the landscape at what was available, it was either prohibitively expensive, it was complex, there was no one-stop shop comprehensive solution, and as Tom was saying earlier on, the intermittent supply of renewable energy is the, the problem. You know, time when demand is high, production can sometimes be low, when production is high, demand is low, and storage is always a, a challenging thing to overcome. So that was the starting point. They looked across to see what was there. There was nothing off the shelf. They could just plug in and then they'd be powered by renewables. Um, and at that point, uh, one of the founders, Chris, went to the States and he came across the idea of using grass as a feedstock for an anaerobic digester. So um, as Thomas was saying, anaerobic digestion is a process where you're breaking down organic material in the absence of oxygen. So he had quite extensive grass in his property. He wanted to use his grass clippings into a microscale digester and use that to power his home. He would get biogas as an output and some digestate. Problem solved, right? Not so much. So, um, when he looked at what I'm calling the biomethane value chain, there were technical and commercial issues across each element of the value chain. And by value chain, I mean each step in a process that gets you from an input to an output. Every bit that adds value is a point in the value chain, hence the name. So the biomethane value chain is about capture. That's the first stage. So capturing and producing the biogas. Processing, as Tom was saying, you take out the CO2 and the nasties. Storage, which is a real issue for biomethane. Distribution, so that's getting it from the point of production to consumption, and then also consumption itself. So the technology and the equipment that's needed to actually generate energy from the biomethane. So the technical barriers for what I'm calling microscale producers, so really small producers, largely across the value chain, microscale technology did not exist or it was really expensive. Anaerobic digesters were out there, but there were those, you know, medium, large scale, those, those big beasts that you see, and they required grid access and a lot of capital investment. Storage of methane was an issue, and actually that was one of the big problems, because in order to move it efficiently and economically, it's much better if you can liquefy it, because you increase the, the energy density by, by a factor of three, um, and you can, so you can move it around. One of the problems with moving liquid methane is that when you liquefy it, you do it cryogenically, so that's 
minus 150 degrees, but it always wants to be returning into a gaseous form. So it's in a container, it's in liquid form, some sort of heat from the external environment starts to seep in and the gas starts to boil off. And what happens is the pressure builds inside the container and then at a point you have to let that gas out. So you have to vent it. So that causes two problems. One is you've just let all of that lovely fugitive methane that you spend time capturing back out to atmosphere, which is an environmental no-no. And then the other thing is from an economic perspective, that's your product and you literally just had to throw it away. So that was a major stumbling block in terms of the biomethane value chain. And then another really important thing to know is that the demand side technologies, so you know, heavy goods vehicles running on gas or, or um, sort of big vehicles, um, they couldn't offer the same performance at the same price point as fossil fuel alternatives. So lots of technical barriers. The market barriers were also quite significant. Um, you just had the sort of medium and large scale on the supply side. There was nothing available for small scale producers. Demand side markets like transport didn't have sufficient infrastructure to encourage adoption. So if the likes of John Lewis wanted to start running their trucks on um, biomethane, they, there were limited amounts of, and there are some public biomethane fueling stations, but there are limited amounts. So a lot of times customers on the demand side would have to stump up the cost of the infrastructure themselves. And it would generally tend to be back to base type operations, which again, limited its adoption on the demand side. Small scale producers just couldn't afford the high cost of equipment. And there was a lack of awareness at the micro scale um, side of the market across the demand and supply side. So lots and lots and lots of barriers. Um, at the point where they formed in 2011, they got some funding from the ESA Bick and Harwell, and they did a, a proof of concept on a storage concept that Chris had come up with. So his idea was you use the boil off gas, to power a refrigeration cycle, and that keeps the methane cool inside the, the vessel, the container that it's in. And that does two things. It means you don't have to vent and you can store it indefinitely. Um, and, but more than that, now you can move it around without needing to, to vent. So at that point, they had done the POC, they were looking for more sort of public investment in projects, and not a lot happened between 2012 and 2015, largely because of all of those sort of economic and technical barriers. In 2015, they widened the team, so they brought together myself, Tom, you know, cryogenics guru, um, and another chap called Derek Jenkins, who's also in Harwell, and he brought a wealth of experience. He'd worked on landfill AD, so he had that side of the sort of biomethane technology chain. Uh, in terms of expertise to bring to the table. So from there, we got our first grant funded project and it was based again on the storage concept and applying it to fuel tanks for heavy goods vehicles. We were working with Iveco and we did a proof of concept on this low pressure um, liquid fuel tank for heavy goods vehicles. And that was the sort of starting point, as I say, to building out the sort of technology chain that we wanted to build across the value chain. So we started with the storage, that same year, we got a grant to do some processing. So we did a small scale processing, what we call a biocycle plant. So that's the bit that takes out the, the CO2 and, and makes pure biomethane. And in 2017, we did a proof of concept around AD and it was a grass fed micro scale grass AD. Um, so during that time, we started to mature our own thinking in terms of what we were going to bring to market. And this, you know, this initial concept of a micro scale grass AD was great, but actually nobody in the marketplace knew about it or wanted it, which is always a problem from economic perspective. But what we did know was out there, we, we knew the farmers were out there. We knew that, that there were existing sets of customers on the supply side. So customers who were already generating fugitive methane through their business as usual activities who could realize real value from a solution much quicker. So in 2019, we had sort of a major milestone as a business where we got our first commercial contracts. The first was with Cornwall Council and they wanted us to deploy on six of their dairy farms. So the council themselves, themselves they own 58 dairy farms in the county. And they're a perfect type of customer for us because they can both be supply side, so they're producing the fugitive methane, but also a demand side customer. They have a group of companies that look after highways and their estate. 
Um, and between those group of companies, I think there's 1,100 vehicles. So they want to transition them all to low carbon vehicles. Uh, the smaller vehicles will be electrified. The larger vehicles, they want to run on the gas that they produce in their farms. So it's this lovely closed loop energy system. And the other commercial contract that we got was with Case New Holland Industrial, who are part of the same group as Aveco that we did the original storage uh, project with in back in 2016. So they saw what we had done with Aveco and they really wanted us to do a similar thing with uh, tractor fuel tanks. So similar to a HGV, the space envelope for the fuel tank is really small. If you can make a conformable fuel tank, you can actually get more fuel in there, which means you can start to get to a similar duty cycle as a petrol or diesel alternative. And that's when things started to get really exciting for us. We did, we did that piece of work for them. We did a prototype and they liked it so much that they became a minority investor last year in March. And as a startup company, and I mean, it's, it's quite a long time I've been a startup company, but we've been doing a lot in that time. You know, cash is always great, but for us, it was much more about the strategic relationship that we were going to be building with them, their support to help us to industrialize the portfolio. And not just that, very much the opening of global channels to market was a really, really key thing for us and the relationship with Case New Holland. So this is essentially what our product portfolio looks like. As I say, we have been very busy over the last six years in particular. We have created a proprietary set of technology aimed at microscale producers. It actually can be scaled to any size, but that was our starting point, that capture, process, store, um, and distribute and consume fugitive methane. Um, this is some pictures of our deployments in Cornwall to date. So this is where we are today. In the top right hand corner, that lovely green balloon, for lack of a better description, is our covered slurry lagoon. So that's where the, the cow slurry gets channeled in there, the methane that comes off it gets captured. And then in the bottom left, that sort of burger van, for, for lack of a better description, beside the truck, is our processing technology. And it's mobile, which is really, really key. And what that means for microscale producers is that they can share the capital costs because it moves from farm to farm upgrading the biomethane, which can then be used into tractors or heavy duty vehicles. Or if you run it through a generator, you can use it to power EVs, which is another thing that we're doing. So you can see here in the middle picture, this is Case New Holland's first methane tractor, which they launched at the beginning of this year. So now it's for the first time a farmer can be energy independent. He or she can use the waste stream from the, the farm to, to power plants and machinery, to power the vehicles, and any excess gets sold into energy markets. Benjamin does that on behalf of the farmer. And as Tom was saying, we split the profits with them. So that enables small scale dairy farming in particular to be sustainable. You know, we've seen in, in the media what a hammering you know, sort of livestock farming has had in recent times just because of the, the environmental impact that they have, but because of the low margins, you know, it's impossible for them to really be able to mitigate their emissions up until now. We're also, as I said, we're doing a, a fugitive methane powered EV charger. And again, what that does is it gives off grid rapid charging capability to be deployed anywhere. Um, as I don't know whether you're aware or not, but most EVs, when they come off the production line, they have an additional five tons of carbon debt over a diesel alternative. So it takes, depending on the energy mix that's used to power it, it can take quite some time for them to write off that carbon debt. If the same EV is being fueled by carbon negative uh, electricity, which is powered by fugitive methane, then it can write off that debt in a much quicker time frame. So we think that's a really exciting opportunity for us to move beyond sort of heavy goods vehicle transport fueling um, use cases. We're going to be deploying this solution, demonstrators, um, three of them in this year. So the maths of methane. Um, this is what a 150 cow farm looks like before we're deploying, deploying anything. So you can see the emissions that come from, you know, piles of, of manure, uncovered slurry lagoons, the red diesel, the heating oil that's used to power the dairy, the red diesel that's powering the tractor, the, the, the enteric fermentation, which is really nothing that we can do about, but chemical fertilizers is, some, is certainly something that we can help to address. So this is the before, 
and this is the after. So we can mitigate a lot of the emissions that are coming from the farm, both in terms of, you know, stopping fugitive emissions from getting there, displacing the fossil fuels that are used on site, and also some of the, the chemical fertilizers, which tend to be very carbon intensive as well. And then you're displacing into transport and heavy goods vehicles that those sort of sectors with the, um, the fuel. This is what the top line numbers look like. So a typical 150 cow farm will produce the equivalent of 4,400 tonnes of CO2 per annum. If they deploy our technology, you can reduce that by two and a half thousand tonnes. And if you then use that methane to displace fossil fuels, there's another 290 tonnes of CO2 equivalent savings there. So that's a total of 2,800 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per annum, which is the equivalent of 140 UK households carbon footprints. And that's from one 150 cow dairy farm. There are 1.8 million cows in the UK alone. And they could, if we, if we harnessed all of the fugitive meth methane that comes from their slurry, we could generate 800,000 tonnes of fugitive methane which would give us the equivalent of 1.68 million UK households carbon footprints abated. We could just wipe them off the balance sheet, which is 6% of UK households, and that's just cows. So as Tom was saying, there are lots of additional sources of fugitive methane, other livestock farms, landfill, food waste, sewage, and we can sell into it a variety of energy markets. It's incredibly flexible as a form of energy, as Tom was saying. If you liquefy it, you can use it to replace diesel or petrol. You can use it as a straight out swap for grid gas, or you can run it through a generator to create carbon negative electricity. So our goal is to create local energy networks which match supply and demand. It's, it's created locally and it's consumed locally, uh, which is a real step change in energy systems. In terms of the mats of methane, um, well, the obvious subtraction is that we're taking fugitive methane from atmosphere. And this is really, it should, it's, it's point number one on the agenda in terms of addressing climate change. That came out in the latest IPCC report. That's why 105 countries, I think, at COP26 committed to cutting methane emissions by 30% by 2030. And this is a real solution that can enable us to get there because both the economic and the environmental benefits work across the value chain. We're also removing utilization of fossil fuels, reliance on imported fuel and gas, and the volatile energy prices that we're all have started to feel but are about to feel in a very very real way over the coming 12 months. In terms of the, the subtraction and the additions that that gives us, well it gives us the opportunity to decarbonize sectors both on the supply and the demand side. So you're talking about decarbonization of agriculture, transport, energy, food, just to name a few. You're also looking at real economic and environmental sustainability for farming, which has been under threat increasingly over the last 20 years. And then finally, there's the opportunity to create closed loop energy economies where we create the value in region and we retain the value in region. So that's it. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, a little bit of methane maths for you. I'll hand back over to Faith. Hey, fantastic. Um, thank you both very much. Um, uh, I, I face, I'll bring you in a second. I yeah. think that was a prize. Um, I think it's a terrific story. And by the way, I think you're a great double act. Um, <laughs> so thank you very, very much indeed. Um, face, I don't know about you, what, uh, one of the, well, actually, um, back to have, Emma yeah. and Tom, I was thinking face is really good at curating questions. So well, if, if we have any, <laughs> yeah. Right. But I, I have a couple myself. So Great. stop. Yeah. Um, so, but isn't this problem of it being stored at minus one hundred and fifty still quite a limiting factor? Uh, not, not really. Uh, as I alluded early on, you've got when the sun shines a lot, and you, when the wind blows a lot, you've got an excess of electricity. And you can use that to process the methane into a liquid form and, and, and store it there. Now, there's, there is a 
so-called power station in Cornwall called Indian Queens, which actually earns more from taking uh, energy, electrical energy off the grid than putting it on. It's because there's so many, you go around Cornwall, there's so many wind farms, you keep tripping over them. And, but the, the infrastructure doesn't allow you to take it off the peninsula. So Indian Queens actually, the, there's a lot of spare energy around. So we can use that to liquefy the methane and use that through generators, as I was saying, at a time when required. So it's acting as a battery. Okay. Um, I just have another quick question before I um, so if people could add their questions into the chat, please. I think we've got one, but just to say, um, have you been on Country File yet? I'm sure it would great, make a great story for them. I wouldn't. Emma would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't yet. Been. No. We had a chat about it at some stage last year, but up until the investment with Case New Holland, we were very much operating in stealth mode because we were trying to develop so many pieces of proprietary technology. And also you're up against the sort of energy big boys, you know, so we wanted to try and stay under the radar as much as possible. It's only really in the last 12 months or so that we've started to do any PR or publicize what we're doing. But Country File is definitely in the pipe. It's, it's definitely one that we'll be doing in the future. Brilliant. Um, there's a question from Alan Ruddle um, saying, is there also an opportunity producing methane from digesting household waste? Yeah, absolutely. Food waste is definitely. Yeah, I think you had that on the chart. The, the, there's a slight problem with landfill sites and, and food waste and, uh, and waste from um, uh, the sewers, if you like, and that, that's because there's a lot of uh, stuff called silanes in shampoos and things like that. Now, if you have, have a silanes and you run that through a, a generator, it can destroy the engine. So until there's a bit of legislation which takes silanes, silanes are just there just to improve the texture of shampoos and things like this. It's not really required. So unless until there's a bit of legislation, that's going to be slightly difficult unless you, you can put it through a burner, but running it through a combustion engine is, is a bit problematic. Mm. I got Thanks. the impression. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, uh, pardon me. I was just interrupting and uh, going to make an observation. Uh, Tom, I just can't uh, let the sort get out of my head that uh, some of your cryogenic friends and admirers uh, uh, would be a bit startled to... to recognize you as an expert in cow poo well you know <laughs> uh, they, they'll also recognize that i'm great at shoveling uh, you know what but, <laughs> but, but lousy at making decisions so yeah. mm. <laughs> um there's uh, a couple of further questions in the chat what's the payback time for a new 150 cow farm to install and use this solution okay so it largely depends on a number of factors, how much time the cows are in the shed, um, how much the farmer wants to use on site, but typical payback is less than five years. Okay, thank you. It's um, a pessimistic case, I think, isn't it, Emma? Yeah, five it's significantly years, less. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a query on Emma's talk from Sirdar. Uh, you showed removal of CO2 from vehicles. Did you allow for the CO2 resulting from methane combustion? So that's where the maths comes in. You know, um, if you're if you're mitigating the equivalent of 86 um, kgs of, of uh, CO2 by capturing one, when you burn that kg of methane, you do get 2.76, I think, back out, but still massively carbon negative. OK. Um, so the, what you've done so far is concentrated in Cornwall with Cornwall County Council. Are you targeting any other? Uh, I don't know where there's a conglomeration of dairy farms or beef yes. farms. Or... Yes, absolutely. Um, at the moment, Faith, we are still, so we're about TRL6, a technology re readiness level six. So that is, if TRL1 is I have an idea, TRL9 is I have a product that's fully formed and in a customer's hand. So even though we're deploying on farm sites, some of the technology chain is around TRL six or seven, and that's where the industrialization with CNHI is really you know, going to expedite our journey to get to TRL nine. We do have um, about three or four commercial farms in the pipeline currently now, and we have another, I think, seven coming through next year, but we're not taking on any new farms until we finish that commercialization process. So we have a passive pipeline that's building and building and we, we, we'd like to be able to go out there and offer it to customers, but 
in terms of the, the technology readiness, we're not quite there yet. But in answer to the question, absolutely. Um, farming networks are really interested, uh, you know, the likes of RODAs or companies that deal with networks of farmers are very interested in the solution. So that is the sort of early adopter segment for us is multi-farm either owners or networks. Okay, um, Alan Ruddle has a comment about SF6, widely used in all large switch gear, including wind and solar farms. And Alan does know about switch gear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As Tom pointed out, it's also a highly potent greenhouse gas. However, it is sealed in the switch gear and by law, leaks must be detected in the SF6 uh, yes. recovered after the switch gear end of life. Alternatives are being developed and are becoming available. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alan, in defense of switch gear. <laughs> <laughs> Question from Phil, who um, has given some talks himself. What, what's the technical regulatory situation with feeding a percent of bio, biomethane into the UK gas grid? Mm. So we, we can feed it into the grid and the, the purity is, is of sufficient quality, but it needs to have some propane added in there in order to meet the specification of the grid gas. But it's perfectly doable. People are doing it now. But okay. it's economically not really worth it for us. Not from my producers because yeah. of the access to the grid, the, the, the economics and accessing um, the grid is just prohibitive for, for micro scale producers. But we, we probably will look at a hub and spoke eventually when we start to build sufficient momentum in a specific area, but not right now. Okay. Uh, Damien has a question, I think. Hi. <clears throat> um, back in the 90s, I managed the uh, anaerobic digestion program at Harwell as part of ETSU um, and have followed the technology uh, right the way through. Um, in the 2000s, um, the anaerobic digesters on farms were well supported through the feeding tariff scheme where they were being used to generate uh, electricity. Um, those digesters are quite um, sophisticated in terms of their control, the stirring, the blend of feedstocks and so on. Are you not just repeating the same technology as they have used, apart from the end use part of it? Yes. And yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you're quite right. I mean, AD is not new. Uh, they used, you know, in India, for example, they, they used to have every, every village had its own AD, you know, system. It's just, a, it's an art that's been forgotten and put by the, you know, if it was making money and, and being useful, every farm would, would have one. And the idea behind Benjamin is to make it useful, you know, by making, you know, making it economically viable. Mm. Yeah. But well, is your anaerobic digestion technology any different to the ones that have uh, been established and, and used on farms? over the last uh, decades. Uh, do you want to take that, Emma, or, or shall I? You go uh, for it. Well, 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 basically, we have uh, labs here where we're looking at the different digesters. The AADs themselves, you know, are, are quite sort of sensitive things. They are a digestive yeah, system, yeah. you know. Um, so, it, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, just bunk stuff into an anaerobic digester and get the methane off. Well, well, if you change the feedstock for an anaerobic digestion system, it burps, you know, it gets dyspepsia uh, and stops producing for a while till the microbes yeah. sort of develop. Well, you know, <laughs> if you're involved in that program, you know exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So, so by targeting sort of the, the cow segment and, and then, you know, other segments in the grass, separately i think we, we can make it economic you know but it's the economic drivers that, that that's the unique thing here not not the ad system and i think you think you you're right in 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 saying that we're just refine finding it again as a technology. yeah i would say one of the key differences to our covered lagoons is that it's a two-stage system so you've got the processing that's happening underneath but then there's a gas bubble that sits on top Yep. So the gas bubble is used to store the, the biogas until the um, biocycle plant can come along and process it. So in that way, it's slightly different. And that offers a number of benefits in terms of economics because you, you, you can just store it in the lagoon itself until you're ready to process it. So it's not vastly different. Um, 
you know, there's a pump room that that pushes the slurry in and out, does the some of the, the, the stirring by the pumping, but there, I, I don't think there's anything truly magical or innovative about the AD. As Tom was saying, it's it's a low cost version. It's as cheap as possible. It's aimed at the micro scale. And that's really what it is. It's just part of that value chain. Um, yeah, and it's optimized for our business model. Yeah. I mean, right. the, the point I was making there is that because it can, the, the lagoon that we've developed can store the gas, the farmer doesn't actually need to own the liquefaction or, or purification equipment. Mm -hmm. It stores enough gas to last a week. And the idea is you bring the, the purification uh, system to the farm once a week, purify it, you know, take it away on, on a lorry and go to the, the lorry goes to the next farm. So the, the, the cap, capex cost of making it economically viable is actually very low. That's why the payback time is, is low. You know, three to five years for, for something like this is really very short. And I was just gonna say, yeah. it sounds like you've really tuned the dials on the business model uh, in Benjamin uh, in a really admirable way. And, and we should say congratulations on getting that investment from Case New Holland. Well done. Mm. Um, okay, I think we're perhaps out of questions. There is a question about whether the, uh, there's much scope to actually reduce the payback time further, um, even though people think it's quite good, actually. I have another one after that, uh, uh, okay. phase. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is there is scope to reduce it. As I say, it depends on what the farmer is going to do with the with the with the fugitive methane. If they want to use a lot of it uh, on site, then it is the payback is longer. If they want to sell everything they have into a transport market, which it attracts a premium in terms of a price point, then the, the payback will come down to sort of the three year mark. Um, but, you know, three to five years in the agricultural sector as a payback is, I think, pretty attractive. Uh, farmers are used to, to it sort of big capital investments and having to pay them back over longer periods of time than that. So, you know, I think it's perfectly reasonable payback, especially for a small scale producer. Um, and Ken also asked how much the capital outlay is. Uh, well, so that depends on whether or not it's, we've got two different types of lagoon, which is one is a, is you build a brand new lagoon, which we call the option one, which is more expensive. Um, another that we're working at the moment is a retrofit. So we just fit a cover over an existing lagoon. Um, but in terms of the overarching, I'll give you a ballpark of about 200,000, but it depends on the size of the farm, the size of the lagoon, whether it's retrofit or not, and how many farms are sharing the processing um, equipment as well. That's just a bit more than a cost of a tractor, isn't it? Mm. You know, it's that sort of you know. mm. <laughs> Okay, John, you wanted to ask a question? Well, actually, uh, we ought to reach out to our honoured guest from Germany, uh, Andrea, uh, and ask if he's got any questions as well. But meantime, just to share a little anecdote uh, with you, I have, in a glamorous part of my life, <laughs> I have shared a tour of slurry pits on a local farm with Tom. <laughs> <laughs> How good does that get? <laughs> That's hard to be, hard to be. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, the pub afterwards that attracted you, John. <laughs> I thought we went to the pub before, but maybe I'm getting mixed up. Um, <laughs> um, the the um, uh, question I wanted to put to Tom, if I'm not mistaken, I've uh, when the H word for hydrogen uh, comes on your screen, I've mm -hmm. I think I've heard you react negatively to hydrogen. No, no it's, it's not negative. I mean, hydrogen's a, a decent little fuel, but it's it, it's it's not naturally found. It's it's a battery. It's not not a fuel. You know, you've got to put quite a bit of uh, energy into um, to actually break you know the the hydrogen from say water if you're doing um uh creating it that way and and it, i i did the sum the other day about you know taking the energy from a wind turbine through a um ooh, what do you call this <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? Through uh, to, to produce the, to split the hydrogen oxygen um, electrolyzer. molecules. Electrolyzer, I can I keep, sorry. It's getting late in the day. Through an electrolyzer and then storing that as a liquid and then using that as a fuel. And really the the the, 
the, the, the efficiency there is awful. Really awful, you know. Mm. You'd have to be pretty desperate to do it that way. Okay. And, Andrea? Any other... I'm here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Andrea. <laughs> Got any hard questions? No, no, no hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had some some curiosities because I am um, um, I'm not entirely new in the technological field, so I um, I can picture how you filter, liquefy, purify. Uh, but I was wondering whether you had any pictures on uh, the first part of the options for collecting. And oh, my... the lagoon. Um, yeah. Um, I think you had a picture, didn't you? I Emma? do. Yeah. Yes. Bear with me. Basically, conventionally, a farmer would, would dig a pit and, uh, and you know, obviously fill it with slurry. And what we've got here, if you look on top right, uh, you can see that that sort of pit is covered. Um, and and it's, it's actually very gas tight, so that we, we get the pure biogas from the lagoon there. And then as the gas starts to build, obviously the bubble just, the gas sits on top and it, it inflates. Yeah. So it's quite deflated in this picture, but it can, it inflates to store the, the gas as it's being produced. Is that just a single farm? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Well, yeah, so this, this, this is one of the six farm pilots. This is a, a another farm where we're, we're tri um, trialing the tractor. This here is a different farm. It's a commercial farm. It's actually our, our proving ground Chinoa farm here on the left. So there's actually three different farms there. Okay. You can see the size of the lagoon now, and that 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 farm is what is that 130 cows? Is it 120? 120 cows. You know, yeah. it's a big big pond. You know, just to short store the. Um, you, know, you can see the cow sheds at the back here with a few cow heads poking out, and what generally happens is they. Um, they do what comes naturally, and then there are uh, sort of like scrapers which pull it into a holding tank, and then that's pumped into the lagoon. Mm. Yeah. Um, do the tanks on the tractors have to be at minus one hundred and fifty degrees? Uh, liquid, yeah, yeah. But this is a compressed. This this picture in the that middle. That one's a compressed one. Compressed. Yeah. yeah, it's a compressed. I may have a picture somewhere of of the. the one running off liquid methane, but then that has a, actually has a, a cryostat uh, bolted to the side of the uh, of the tractor, in place of the of the um, uh, of the diesel tank. I mean, you you wouldn't walk up to it and recognise the would say it's it's a you know it's a different tractor. It it looks very similar. It's a very strange shaped cryostat, but you know you, you wouldn't. Uh, it doesn't look any different to a normal one. Emma, am I right thinking you're based on Harwell campus? That's correct, yeah. Do you have any call or contact or have use for the Miracle Company who I believe are uh, kind of specializing in detecting fugitive uh, methane? I didn't realize there was somebody on site doing that. Absolutely, um, John, that would be really useful to be in contact with them. If you wouldn't mind passing me the details, that'd be great. I. I just saw recently, to my surprise, actually, I mean, I know they can uh, spot me saying from the sky or whatever, uh, and, and they have been focusing up until now, I think, on maybe hydrocarbon installations. Uh, and uh, but recently that they, they've been they, they've come into play with um, uh, farming and agriculture, and I think possibly triggered by uh the new the, the sort of new food strategy that was published th towards the end of last year um yeah we, uh, we we've had a firm at at the, at the at least one of the farms looking uh, at any methane leakage from the lagoon yeah. covers um which i think is similar to what you've described john yeah, yeah very useful I'll, yeah definitely be of interest i'll follow that up uh, tomorrow with you emma um, actually, Faith, one thing I really enjoyed in uh, Tom's slides and presentation was the molecular uh, description of greenhouse gases. Oh, I yeah. never, that, that was kind of new to me. Yeah, that was clever. 
Yeah. Maybe I've missed it elsewhere, yeah. but thank yeah. you for that. That's good. I, I will say it's a very simplified, uh, you know, model, you know, yes. description of, of the greenhouse effect. You know. I like simple. We like simple. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, th there's a question about so what, what happens in summer when the cows are out on pasture? Because presumably you can't collect all the dung then. The yeah. So they're dairy cows, so they spend 25% in the in the shed anyway of milking time. So between the winter and the 25% that they spend being milked, oh. most farms will be, well, most cows will be six, six, between six and seven months we'll have of shed-based uh, mm. inputs, feedstock, shall we say. So that that is what that is. It's just what we collect while they're being milked and when they're um, being housed for the winter. Mm. I guess it's, it's quite funny, actually. Yeah, sorry. sorry, we're talking to one of the farmers. You know, the cows don't like being outside. They'd much rather be in. It's it's the, it's the, the supermarkets that want them to be outside for a certain um, yeah kind of year. They don't like it. They prefer to be in the shed. You know? It's a bit worrying. Well, I don't know. Yeah, that I guess that's the case for moving to the really high input intensive cow rearing systems where they never see the light of day. Yeah. No, we do not want that fate. No. So, good. Good. That's Whether they're good. happy or not, they need to be out in the field. That's all there is to it. Yeah, I agree. Um, and Ken says, actually, is any collection done from the open fields? No. No. OK. OK. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? By the way, there was another uh, brilliant takeaway. I think in your talk, Tom, when you equated um, a patch of grass to gallons of gas, um, yeah, one square meter of grass will produce as much energy in a year as a liter of petrol. Fantastic, mm, mm. fascinating. So it's worth doing, you know. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Shall we Great. draw yeah. things to a close, face? I think so. Yes, thank you. Unless anyone else has anything, but I think that's, that's yeah. probably it. Um, well, thank you for listening. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. It was a really entertaining and informative talk. Great. Thanks, everybody. Okay, yeah, thank you, really brilliant. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I suppose, um, Faith, we should just give a little trailer for what's to come. Yeah. So next time, um, we think we'll be back in Wildwood. I think we just have to um, look at the newsletter and see what's happening and things. But um, um at the moment the plan is to be back in wildwood and uh cinema and that camilla Bowe, who is i think the head of um wild oxfordshire is that right john um yep. will be talking um about how we can all help to achieve nature's recovery across oxfordshire so i think it's about sort of working in partnership and what can be done at different levels and by the way, word of warning to Emma and Tom, uh, when word gets out about this talk, um, uh, Café Scientifique all over the network are going to be after you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. What's yeah. this space? No, it's fantastic. Really, yeah. really great. Um, I have one favour to ask. Um, in those slides, Tom, you it was you actually who highlighted it. Um, you said that the uh, schematic of a cow looked like a not a very happy cow. Well, <laughs> that particular <laughs> one, yeah. <laughs> yeah can, can you personalities. Not, can you not find a happy cow uh, oh. drawing? <laughs> That's just with our graphics provider team. So it's got to go on what we're given. <laughs> Should have asked for oh. happy cows. <laughs> hey, thank you both so much. Really, really great. I'm sure everybody uh, really ears pricked up, tuned in very much to uh, what you're doing. A round of applause from Ken, even. So uh, you, you really have one out tonight. So thank you very, very much indeed. And thank look you. forward to seeing you soon. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.
Alistair, forgive me. I think I've just seen a message from you saying, should I press stop on record? Yeah, can, can you hear me? I can. Hey, good, it's just the two of us and Stephen Burke. Um, oh, and he's gone. Hey, okay, hey, well, when you stop the recording, you'll get an email in half an hour or so. Okay. If you just send that to me, then I'll deal with it. And if you have any trouble, I'll let you know.